The Laughing Cavalier here, presenting to you another tale of these troubled times. Today, I shall be doing a quick review of the first episode of the 1971 series Elizabeth R. Firstly, a bit of backstory to the series as a whole before we dive into the episode itself. 1970 was a good year for the BBC, with its Six Wives of Henry VIII series doing very well, and so, continuing this trend, it was decided to make a sequel, Elizabeth R, looking at the life and reign of Queen Elizabeth I, the daughter of King Henry VIII. A few actors from the Six Wives series returned, albeit briefly for the first episode, including Bernard Hepton, once again reprising his role as Archbishop Thomas Cranmer, Basil Dignam as Bishop Thomas Gardner, and John Ronani as Thomas Seymour, with Rosalie Crutchley appearing as Catherine Parr in a few flashbacks. The new actors, though, would include Robert Hardy as Robert Dudley, Earl of Leicester, Ronald Hines as William Cecil, Lord Burley, and Glenda Jackson as Elizabeth I herself. The series, while still suffering from a small budget like The Six Wives, was able to film a few more scenes on location, most notably at Pencehurst Palace in Kent. However, I will cover the differences in costumes and sets as I progress throughout this series. And so, without any further ado, let us look at the first episode, The Lion's Cub. As mentioned, the series covers most of Elizabeth's life and reign, this particular episode covering the period from January 1549 to November 1558, a period of almost a decade, and covers the events leading to Elizabeth's accession to the throne. I will say that, right off the bat, this series gives us the best portrayal of Elizabeth I ever. Glenda Jackson, who not only physically resembles Elizabeth better than any other actress, also perfectly captures her personality. This first episode, though, is slightly jarring, since in 1549, during the first arc of the episode, the real-life Elizabeth was barely 15 during these events, whilst Glenda Jackson was about 35 when she made this. A similar problem that Annette Crosby had when playing Catherine of Aragon in the opening scene of the Six Wives series. However, it is only for a short while, and it is understandable since it would have been difficult to cast a 15-year-old, and then, since the series makes a jump to 1554, to see Glenda Jackson in the role. We do get some great scenes with her in this one though, such as the one she has with her sister Mary just after her accession, where they trade blows over the question of religion, which then devolves into a look at the history these two half-sisters had. The way it is presented is not to make one a hero and the other a villain, but to show just what both of these women believed and present that rather than imparting one message or t'other onto the audience. Speaking of Mary, I would say that Daphne Slater's portrayal of her was one of the best of the monarch I have ever seen. She really embodies the physical look of Mary very well, and shows her devotion to the Catholic Church, and the reasons why she clung so much to her faith and the memory of her mother. I would say that she also comes across as sympathetic at times. We get scenes where she laments over her lost youth, her anger at not having a son and heir, and her desperate desire to keep her new husband Philip of Spain by her side. Mary is quite often dismissed as a fanatical Catholic lunatic in some adaptations, and even though we do get mention of the burnings and so on, we see her side of things very well, and are also shown how her counsellors, like Stephen Gardner, were involved in the burnings as well. A shame that this is, for obvious reasons, the only episode with Mary in it. But, combine this with her appearances in the Six Wives series, and we get the best portrayal of her ever put to screen. Another character you will see throughout the series is that of the then Sir William Cecil, later Lord Burley, played by Ronald Hines. Now, some of his acts in this particular episode are inaccurate, most notably him riding to warn Mary of her brother's death, and the attempt to put Lady Jane Grey on the throne, where, despite being a Protestant himself, he affirms his loyalty to the true monarch. In reality, while Cecil was initially resistant, he did eventually sign the device for the succession. He only switched sides once Northumberland had left London to confront Mary, since, by that stage, he knew which way events would go, not right away as he does in this series. I don't mind this scene too much though, since his loyalty to the Tudor dynasty was one of his traits, and it nicely reinforces his character for the future episodes. Other than that though, he's very ably portrayed here, being shown as active in supporting Elizabeth during her imprisonment. In terms of events overall, they are broadly accurate. The attempt by Thomas Seymour to kidnap King Edward VI is very well done, right down to him killing his dog, although, as a quick aside on Edward since he is barely in this episode, he was not a sickly boy his whole life. Aside from a brief illness when he was very young, he was in pretty good health for most of his life, and seemed to be on the path to become an effective, if somewhat fanatically Protestant, ruler. His illness and death was rather sudden, hence why Lady Jane Grey was only made his successor at the last moment. If he had been at death's door for six years, then the Protestants in the council would have made attempts to change the succession long before this. Still, that was the view of Edward at the time the series was made, so I cannot complain too much. 
There are still a few more inaccuracies with some events though, most notable being Gardner actually ordering Elizabeth's execution at one point, with Cat Ashley's intervention basically being the main reason why it does not go ahead. In reality, while some of Mary's counsellors did want Elizabeth out of the way, they did not go so far as to try and secretly execute her behind Mary's back, since such an action would be seen as murder without proper legal proceedings, whether by a trial or an act of attainder, and would bring the Queen's wrath down upon them. Even Lady Jane Grey was given a trial. Generally though, the bulk of the scenes are accurate, and if I ever do a full review, I will make sure to look at them in more detail. If I had to criticise the episode, then I would say that it makes me wish that the BBC had done a series covering Edward VI and Mary I before this one, since there is so much glossed over in order to get to Elizabeth's reign, which is a shame. There are a lot of interesting things that happened during the 1547 to 1558 period, often referred to as the Mid-Tudor Crisis, that would have been interesting to see. For example, England was engaged in a war with Scotland, called the Rough Wooing, an attempt to secure the young Mary Queen of Scots, which would have been a nice way to set up the events regarding her later on in the Elizabeth R series. The cost of the rough wooing led to financial instability, weakening the power of Edward Seymour, Duke of Somerset, who, as Lord Protector, was effectively ruling the country. And, despite being a fairly major character in the Six Wives series, is only mentioned in passing here. The rebellions of 1549, namely the Enclosure Rebellion in East Anglia and the Prayer Book Rebellion in Cornwall, were major events that are, yet again, not covered. Seymour's successor, John Dudley, Duke of Northumberland, is only seen in a few scenes briefly. Historically, he basically saved England from the disasters of the early years, and had he not tried to put his stepdaughter, Lady Jane Grey, on the throne, he would probably have been held in higher regard. Speaking of Jane, again she is relegated to two cameos of her being inaccurately at Edward's deathbed, and a scene of her holding her neck whilst being locked in the tower, foreshadowing her execution, which happens off screen. Even Mary's reign was no less dramatic, with Ket's rebellion coming very close to succeeding, and Mary showing her resolve by refusing to leave the city, which helped rally her troops. The loss of Calais to the French, again briefly mentioned in a future episode, would have been a great story to look at. There was so much material here that could have made an interesting Edward and Mary series. It is a shame we did not get that, and in particular, I would have liked a bit more stuff with Lady Jane Grey, since she did live with Elizabeth for a while, and her execution was a rather tragic affair. But, hey, budgets were limited, and we should be grateful that we have what we got. As mentioned, this series, yet again, did have a small budget. Better than the Six Wives series, mind you, but still very small for a drama covering such a wide sweep of history. Since this series spans the course of over half a century, then there would have to be a lot of changes in regards to costumes and so on throughout the series. This first episode covers the 1550s and, overall, I would say it did a decent job at covering what people would be wearing during this time period. The owner of the guard, for example, are wearing costumes that are pretty accurate for that decade, being now in red and black that was first adopted by King Henry VIII, replacing the white and green Tudor livery that they had worn under his father and the first years of his reign. The headdresses the ladies wear are, again, pretty accurate, mainly items such as the French hood that began appearing during the 1510s and 20s, but were now evolving in style to look more like this. Elizabeth mainly wears a red dress in this episode, which I would guess is based off of this 1546 portrait of her, so it is good to see, yet again, as they did with the Six Wives series, they visited the galleries and museums to see what sort of outfits people would be wearing during this time period. I would say as well that the sets were a bit better than the Six Wives series, I think they probably reused a few from that one, like this bedchamber for example, but some are bigger and better, with proper ceilings and floor tiles now, added with the fact that we get a few more exterior shots as opposed to the Six Wives series, where only the Jane Seymour episode really had any proper exterior scenes. A thoroughly authentic drama yet again. I would expect no less from this particular line of dramas. I do feel that this episode is probably the most rushed of the series since it covers a decade of turmoil and plotting, and has to boil it down to an hour and a half. That means we miss so many details, as mentioned earlier with Edward's reign, and the Lady Jane Grey stuff being effectively a series of cameos to quickly get the plot to Elizabeth's troubles with Mary. The series is very dialogue heavy of course, owing to the lack of sets and so forth, but they were effectively envisaged as plays from the outset, and the series does give us the details we need to know for that particular scene to work. Whether it be the scene, where it is explained to Elizabeth just how Thomas Seymour's actions could be seen as treason, two lines about the order of succession and so on. This episode in particular is full of plots and schemes. It does rush through quite a cast of characters that are hurriedly introduced, such as the French and Spanish ambassadors, 
so you do have to pay attention a bit, otherwise you will lose track of who is who. This is always going to be a problem with something covering so tumultuous a period, but to be honest, I think the episode did a pretty decent job setting things up and showing the circumstances regarding Elizabeth's accession to the throne. Where the episode really shines though is in its dialogue and acting. I would love to properly include some of my favourite clips here, but since I have been copyright claimed by the BBC before, you will have to take my word on it and go and watch the episode for yourself. In particular, Glenda Jackson is the star of the episode and the series as a whole. We will be looking at her performances in the future episodes as well, so I will leave some quotes for then, but I will say that her presentation of Elizabeth's firm manner even before she was queen was great. Most notably the scene where she enters the tower and basically forces the lieutenant, her jailer, to dismiss his own guards. Taking the history out of the equation, and that scene on its own reinforces just what authority this character commands, even at such a dangerous time for her. Overall, a pretty solid first episode for the series. In comparison to the later episodes, I would say it is probably one of the weaker ones of the series, due to how much it has to cover and set up. But considering the fact that the series is so good overall, that is not much of a criticism. This episode needed to lay the foundations and backstory for her life and reign, and I believe it did a decent job of that. And, as we proceed with the series, we will see more great scenes to come. In the meantime, this has been The Laughing Cavalier, wishing you a good day.